Shh. Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of the Talk is Cheap Show, episode number 62. Hope you're all well, healthy and COVID free. Thanks for tapping in, man. We really appreciate your support. We've got another great show lined up for you today. But before we go any further, it is my great pleasure to introduce my co-host, show analyst, YouTube content creator, former professional footballer turned football academic, the erudite, the entertaining, the honest, the forthright, Mr. Curtis Shaw in the house. What are you saying, bro? Where's Craig Paulson, man? Where is he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to get onto that later, man. We're going to get onto that. But anyway, how are you, man? What have you been up to? Tell the people, bro. No, I'm good, man. Listen, same as everyone, man. Working from home, just, you know, Zoom meetings, 5K runs, all that usual rubbish, man. We're just hoping um, to get through it safely, man. I can't wait for it to finish, to be honest. Yeah, man. I mean, as, as you guys know, um, I had a little episode with COVID myself, and it's taken me a little while to get back into the swing of things. Uh, yeah. I've been doing the walk in, but I've actually started running again now. Yeah. And I'm doing my five, six K runs uh, three, four, five times a week, and I'm enjoying it, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's a slow process trying to get back to normal. But, you know, I thank, I'll give blessings that I'm alive to tell the tale, man, because I know oh. there's been um, several other people who haven't. So, yeah, man. But anyway, moving on then. Um, those of you familiar with the show will know that the first segment of the show is to look at news and notes, which is basically the stories making the headlines since our last show. And I think the major story to hit the headlines in the past week um, was the sad passing of Tom Moore. Yeah? Um, yeah. Okay, he's not a football figure, but I think it's fair to say that in the last year or so during the pandemic, he's become probably the most, well, one of the most iconic figures around. Um, so, so Tom Moore then, former captain in the army, war veteran of a couple of wars, a uh, hundred years of age. And what he did was to lift the spirits of the country during the very depths of the pandemic when he helped to raise, I think it was in excess of a staggering 33 million in yeah. charity during his walks around his garden. You know what I mean? So, um, and how ironic it is that he should pass from the very thing that he was helping lift the spirits of the nation from. So yeah, very sad news. And I'm sure uh, that on behalf of AFTV, yourself and everybody connected with football, sports, everywhere, you know, particularly in this country, we all send uh, heartfelt condolences to Sir Tom's family. Um, Curtis, you got any thoughts on that, bro? I mean, just briefly, I think um, without getting too deep, I think I think that aim in anyone's life is to leave a legacy behind. And this man's left a strong legacy behind, man. You know, he's, he's not somebody who's going to be forgotten. So, Listen, man. Just uh, condolences to his family, and obviously, sad news. But you know, he leaves a he leaves a strong legacy behind him, man. Yeah, excellent point. Well said, man. Yeah, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. Some more sad news that actually uh, just coming through the airwaves, but I'm sure in uh, in the following days people will be talking about it more. And that's uh, Paul Cannaville getting news that he's critically ill in hospital. Paul Cannaville, for those of you who don't know. Uh, I think he was the first black player, wasn't he, to play for Chelsea. Um, he became famous through that. And obviously, he had some difficult times whilst at Chelsea with the racism and so forth. He's since then become a bit of a media character. He's also a philanthropist. He does a lot of work for charity himself. He's got a foundation. And to hear the news this morning that he's um, he hasn't been well for some time, but hearing now that he's uh, critically ill in hospital, following... Um, some complications from some emergency surgery yet. So that's very sad. Curtis, yeah. do you want to expand on that at all? Or you got any well, thoughts? Let's, let's hope he pulls through, man. A, a very big figure in football. And, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully he recovers from it as soon as possible. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, Give him, wishing him all the best and sending out best wishes to his family and friends and everybody connected with him. Um, moving on a little bit then. Um, the transfer window, I thought that in the last week, we know now that yeah. the transfer window's closed. And yeah. I'll you'd spend a little bit of time just getting your overall thoughts on uh, Arsenal's transfer activity during the window. Um, I think it's fair to say that Arsenal were one of the more active clubs in the Premier League. Um, and I've made a little list of some of the outgoings and incomings. So if we look at the outgoings, 
Um, William Saliba, he's gone to Nice on loan. Uh, Said Kalasinac, Schalke on loan. Uh, Socrates, he had his contract cancelled by mutual consent, but I gather there's a few clubs in the offing for him, so I think he'll find some first-team football, well, a football club soon. Uh, Matt Macy, goalkeeper, uh, he uh, has gone to a Bernian, I believe, on a permanent deal. Mm. Uh, Meza Ozil, uh, he's gone to Fenerbahce, we know that, that's on a permanent deal. Schroeder Mustafi, uh, he's gone to Schalke. Uh, Ainsley Maitland Nile, Ainsley Maitland, Ainsley Maitland Niles. That name, a <laughs> tongue twister. Yeah, he's gone to uh, West Brom on loan. We can, I'm sure we're going to talk about that a bit more. Joe Willock, Newcastle on loan. So yeah, so those are the outgoings, incomings. Matt Ryan, goalkeeper. Um, he's come in, fill the second goalkeeping spot. We we presume. And Martin Odegaard, uh, attacking creative midfielder. Yeah. Okay, Curtis, so you've heard me list the outgoings and incomings. First of all, overall, what was your thoughts on the Arsenal's activity in the transfer window? So, I mean, it was a productive window in the sense that we got players out the door that we've needed to get out the door for a long time. Um I suppose you wonder why some of these deals weren't done in the summer. But maybe, you know, Edu didn't have full control then. I know Raul Sanelli went halfway through the summer window. Um, so I think he's done well in this window to get them players out. Effectively, he's clearing up a mess that was left here from Arsene Wenger and Ivan Gazidis. You know, bang average players on massive contracts that are almost impossible to get rid of. I mean... Players that, you know, you look at Mustafi, £35 million goes for nothing. Meza Ozil, £42 million was our record transfer, goes for nothing. How many of these players have we bought and not managed to sell for any money? You know, termination of contract is actually, Arsenal would have had to pay these players to walk away from that contract. So they're actually spending money to get rid of these players. So, but I have to give Edu some credit um, for getting that done. I didn't see Meza Ozil leaving in January, to be honest, so I'm surprised. And then in terms of, of players coming in, you look at the market, hardly anyone has, has spent any money. It's a very difficult window. I think we was all hoping for Arsenal to go and spend 30 or 40 million on someone, really, football fans, but it just doesn't seem like that window where you could get it done. So I suppose Odegaard and and Matt Ryan are not bad. If I was being a little bit greedy, I would have liked another left-back to have come in um, because Tierney seems to get these little injuries and, um, you know, Cedric filling in there is all right. But I think most people would like Cedric to be playing at right-back at the moment. So a left-back would have been decent. But I think under the circumstances, it's uh, we had a productive window without it being the most exciting of windows, if I, if I can put it like that. Yeah, I would agree with you. You make some good points there. I think we've been active and I think most of the deals that were done, you, you, you're kind of thinking, well, that makes sense. So from that perspective, I think, yeah, I think we, we've done quite well in this window. And of course, as you alluded to earlier, um, it would appear that the manager and Edu, uh, by getting rid of some of the players that have been there on these long-term contracts that, you know, let's face it, didn't have a long-term future at the club. They're basically clearing the decks yeah, uh, for to bring players in in the future, and that will in effect become um, the manager Mikel Arteta's team. I just yeah. wanted to uh, pick your brains on a few though. Yeah, that kind of stood out to me, especially in the last week. Uh, what did you make of the Ainsley Maitland Niles um, going to West Brom? Now we know he, he was linked with Leicester, then with Southampton, and it would yeah. appear that, um, the club didn't want to let him go to Leicester, uh, and were sort of trying to steer him in a direction of Southampton, which he turned down. He's now yeah. in the at West Brom. What's your thoughts on that, bro? I mean, it, it kind of it kind of smells of desperation for Ainsley Maitland-Niles because you look at the summer, we turned down a bid from Wolves for him, which I thought was a very good move for him at the time. But the club decided to keep him. You know, he's, he's, uh, he's in his early 20s, England international, they keep him. He's hardly kicked a ball for Arsenal this season. And in fact, when he has played, some games he's been really good, some not so good. 
And then, you know, he would have probably looked at that Leicester move and thought, I want that move. Leicester are flying at the moment. They've got a good young team. I believe he's good friends with James Madison as well. The club don't let him go to Leicester, which is a little... It's interesting because I get not selling a player to a rival, but number one at the moment, Leicester are not our rivals. And number two, if we're deeming Ainsley Maitland-Niles not good enough, you know, why, why would you have a problem selling effective mm. someone you don't rate high enough for. But anyway, um, and then Southampton apparently turned them down. He didn't want to play at fullback. He ends up at West Brom. I don't think that's a great move for Arsenal or for Ainsley Maitland-Niles because he's going to a team that I think are going to get relegated. They lost to Sheffield United at the bottom. But I mean, West Brom are going down. they got the worst goal difference in the league. Sam Allardyce, long ball. He's going to play centre mid. They're going to get turned over most weeks. They'll get relegated. I'm not sure Southgate will pick him playing for West Brom. And also, if he gets relegated, that devalues him in a way. So if Arsenal do want to sell him in the summer, he's just had six months in a team getting slapped all over the place. Maybe doesn't help his value. So I think he is just desperate to play football. And I think he just thought, listen, any Premier League club that will play me in centre mid, I'm going there. So... Uh, I can understand from his point of view. I've got to be honest. I think Ainsley has been quite harshly treated at Arsenal. I've got to be honest. Um, if you turn down a move for a player to a good football club and then don't play him on the back of that, I think you've done him quite dirty. And considering he came through the academy, you know, they, they haven't they haven't been great to him. Uh, has he grabbed the opportunity at Arsenal with both hands? Maybe not. You know, he had a year of bellering out the team and never really stamped his authority at right back. But um, I think they could have handled it a little better. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, you know what, bro? It's very hard to, dis for me anyway, to disagree with anything you say there. I think you're pretty much spot on. I think he has been, to all intents and purposes, somewhat harshly treated. Uh, I think he's been underused. And you make it a very good point about the Wolves, that would, have been a, that would have been a mutually beneficial move, I would have thought, if he wasn't going to be in the manager's long-term plans. The season yeah. starts, he doesn't play. When he has played, he's played well. Um, he's, there's a couple of times, his most recent appearance, actually, when he didn't play so well. So it just hasn't worked out for him. I do feel a bit of empathy for him. Um, I'm not sure if that West Brom move is a good move for him, I must say. We all remember what happened to Serge Gnabry when he went to West Brom. Yeah, yeah. Um, Listen, man, I, I wish him all the best. I hope it goes well, but I'm a little bit uh, sceptical about that move. Yeah. No, Willa, what did you make of that? He's got the Newcastle. See, on the flip side, I think this is a great move for Joe Willock because Joe Willock's one of these players that I've always looked at and I thought there's something there, but he needs game time. He seems to have a lack of understanding and, and his decision making. He's got power, he's got pace, he makes them quality third-man runs that kind of Aaron Ramsey used to make from midfield. But the, the problem with Joe Willock is that decision-making, the final ball, the final shot is often not the right one. But, you know, Joe Willock hasn't had a loan move. And um, I think with a lot of these players coming out of the under-23s, they need football before they go into the first team and be successful. I mean... Occasionally, you'll find the odd one like Saka or whoever who can just takes to it straight away. But I think Joe Willock needs game time. I think Newcastle is a big football club. Uh, they don't score that many goals from midfield. So if Willock can go there and start scoring goals, they've got a few good attacking players like Seb Maximum, Almiron, Callum Wilson. Um, so listen, I, I think this is a very good move for Joe Willock. Even moving out of London, you know, he was talking about how it was, it's going to be strange moving out of the city and stuff. I think that will help him grow up. So I hope he does really well there. I still think Joe Willett's got an opportunity to have a, a future at Arsenal, but he needs to improve. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a good move for him. Again, I would have to agree with that, man. Yeah, I mean, Joe Willett, um, there's been a lot of um, conjecture as to whether he's good enough for Arsenal. I think this loan move will prove if he's good enough at this level, Premier League yeah. level. Um, I think Newcastle is a decent club for him to go. Um, hopefully he can get some game time and establish himself in the first first team and um, let's see where he goes. Uh, because, you know, I'm one of them. I'm a, you know what I mean? I don't know whether he's, he's up to it. I see the talent there, but it hasn't quite come together yet to fruition. So I think that this move, again, is a mutually beneficial move for both parties. Because I yeah. think if he goes there, especially, and he does well, 
he will develop and then Arsenal will be getting a better player back um, in the summer for the next season or if they want to move him on. So yeah. market value will increase. So, yeah, man. OK, thanks for that, Curtis. Appreciate that. Um, another one of our features is to look at Arsenal's last game since the last show. So since our last show, we know that Arsenal played twice. Uh, the first of those games was a home Premier League match against our big rivals from the North, Man United. Now, interestingly, we had um, Rance on from the Rants and Banks channel. Shout out to Rance. He yeah. came on the show last week and we were uh, previewing this game. And I remember he said quite categorically that he predicted a stinky nil-nil draw is what he called it. <laughs> he both teams cancelling each other out. Yeah. And uh, I've got to say that, you know, looking back at that game, he was absolutely right, in my opinion. Yeah. You got it right. Um, he called it correctly. It wasn't much of a game. It was nil-nil. And we did pretty much cancel each other out, Arsenal and Man United. Curtis, your thoughts on that, bro? I mean, what I will say for a nil-nil, it was quite an entertaining nil-nil. You know, it wasn't it wasn't a, a game where you didn't think there was going to be goals. We looked like we were trying to score. United had chances. We had chances. I think in the end, a draw was a fair result. Um, looking at it, you know, Cavani missed two sitters for them. Uh, the second one in particular, I don't know how he missed that. Um, so United, from that point of view, would have been disappointed. They had a lot of possession. We hit the ball with Lacazette, good free kick. Smith Rowe had a shot. Willian had a great chance. You know, that could have really turned around his time at Arsenal. Sometimes that one moment when the fans are on a player's back, you come on and score the winner against United, all is forgiven, but didn't happen for him. I thought Pepe was was really good again. You know, he, he you could tell that Luke Shaw was scared of him from last season. Uh, we just didn't get the ball to Pepe enough, really. But uh, I thought he had a good game. And look, I thought all in all, considering the players we had out, no Tierney, no Aubameyang, no Saka, Gabriel on the bench, um, I thought nil-nil against second place United was was not a bad point for Arsenal. So I, I, I did see the positives in that performance, to be honest. OK. Now, I see the positives. Um, I would disagree with you slightly where you called it an entertaining game. I'd go as far as to say intriguing because mm -hmm. it was, you know, a clash of two big clubs and, you know, it was a high-profile game. Yeah. But in terms of entertainment, I wouldn't say I was that entertained by it. But, but hey, man, you know what I mean? But yeah, yeah, listen, thanks for that, bro. So our second game, then, um, Premier League fixture away to Wolves. Um, we lost that one 2-1. However, I would, I'm just going to start quickly by saying that yeah. the result didn't really reflect what happened on the pitch, um, which is that basically we started the game very well. It was good to see us come out the traps, you know what I mean, going at them. Uh, I thought we were well on top in the first half. Saka had goal disallowed. Um, Pepe then scored an excellent goal. He's been in good form. Shout out to Pepe. Free Pepe, by the way. <laughs> um, that's my mantra. That's been my mantra for a few weeks now. So it's good to see him get on the score sheet. And once again, as he has against Man United, he, he performed very well. So it was good to see him get on the score sheet. But then, controversially, just before half time, man, um, David Luiz uh, finds himself in a moment. He gives away a penalty and then gets a subsequent red card. Um, Wolves convert the penalty, and that pretty much changed the game completely. You know, what I mean, we've gone from controlling the game and bossing it really to, uh, to Wolves going in at half time at one each, and we're down to ten men. Um, Second half, wonder strike by Jan Martino makes it 2-1 to Wolves. And then later on in that game, with us still in it, by the way, Leno, who I've been a big fan of and spoken very highly of on this show, yeah. inexplicably gets himself sent off. Mad moment there for handling outside the area. We go down to um, nine men, 2-1 down. Any realistic hope of getting back in the game or salvaging something is pretty much gone and we go on to lose the game 2-1. So I was a bit disappointed. So that was a game which we could have and indeed should have won. We ended up losing. Um, so that's my thoughts on it. Curtis, man, you're the expert in the house. What are you saying about that one, bro? What's your thoughts? I mean, i got to be honest, this was a devastating loss for Arsenal. I think this, this really 
this one really hurt. Every defeat hurts, but this one just felt like it was unnecessary. Do you know what I mean? Um, what I will say before we before we look at other incidents, I always like to look at what you can do better yourself. And I think where the Arsenal players have to take some responsibility is that game should have been finished in the first half. Um, to get a one-on-one -on -one in 45 seconds away from home, you know, that, that kind of tells you where Wolves were at. I don't think Wolves had scored for the last two or three games. They hadn't won in seven. Confidence was rock bottom. You know, they were there to be beaten. Now, I watched them against Palace at the weekend. They didn't look like they would have scored if they were there for three weeks. They come and play Arsenal, they score two goals. But yeah, as I'm saying, from Arsenal's point of view, well, we had the goal disallowed. Um, Saka misses the one-on-one. -on -one. I think he should score that, i got to be honest. I'm not blaming Saka because he's been brilliant, but I think he should score that. We should have been two or three nil up at half-time. Right. I, don't, I don't think Wolves do anything if we go two nil up. I think they're finished. Having said that, we did play very well in the first half. Obviously, then the red card happens. And from the moment that happened, I think every Arsenal fan sat there and thought, this game is up in the air now, you know, 10 men. How can we manage it? Can we win it? Will we still have enough attacking threat? Now, me and you were talking off camera about, about the David Luiz incident. And um, we got similar views, although just slightly different. I, I, think, um, I think it is a penalty, first of all. I think it is a penalty because not every foul has to be purposeful. A collision can still be a penalty. For me, it is a penalty. I just think it was a yellow card because of this double jeopardy rule that they say now. If the if the team gets a penalty and you had no you have shown no intent to make a tackle, I don't think you should get a red card. That that is in the rule, this double jeopardy rule. So for me, David Luiz should have got a yellow card for that incident because he makes no attempt to win the ball. Red card, yes. Maybe he should have tried to run around the player. But for me, it should have been a yellow card. And I still think with 11 players on the pitch, we could have won that game in the second half. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we could have. Um, yeah, um, yeah, interesting summarisation. Um, like you said, we we are at slight odds there because, yeah. and I'm not trying to um, cap or anything like that, man, but um, I was at the watch along uh, with the guys. Shout out to Robbie and all the guys who uh, contributed to the, or participated in the watch along. Good, good stuff as usual. Um, and I must admit, when the guy had gone through and I saw David Louise running him down like that, I must admit, man, I had my, you know what I mean? I, I was on tenter hooks. When he goes down, from it can be established that there is contact, then I'm afraid to say, man, that whilst it may seem harsh, I think the penalty and the sending off are justified. Now, listen, I understand about the double jeopardy rule. And I, you know, I understand that Arsenal fans are going to be upset at how it happened. It did look a bit harsh. It did look like the Wolves player was playing for it. Um, the, the contact was minimal. But at the end of the day, man, we see this a lot. You know what I mean? Strikers are going to be very cute in that position. And where I am slightly critical of David Luiz, and again, listen, man, I, I've been a fan of David Luiz throughout the years. I think he's an excellent player. And when he joined the club, I just want to put this out there. I was one of those that was welcoming him in. Uh, as opposed to others who were saying, oh, he's former Chelsea, uh, he makes too many mistakes, blah, blah, blah. But the one thing you've got to say about David Luiz, he's had a lot of sending offs throughout his career. In fact, I saw a stat the other day where they said that he's the most sent off defender in Premier League history. Now, I don't know how true that is, but that yeah. was the stats that I've seen coming up in the last couple of days. So you've got to say to yourself that David Luiz is also one of the most, if not the most experienced players at Arsenal. In, probably in that whole pitch last night. And he's been sent off a lot of times. So you've got to say to yourself, if the striker's got a run on you and he's going through on goal, he's got to be a bit more careful there, bro. You know what I mean? Like, you've got to use your brain a little bit more. You've got to be a bit cuter, you know? And he allowed that to happen, is what I'm saying. And um, I just think he needed to be a little bit more street smart in that situation. I don't think the likes of a uh, Van Dyke would have made a similar error. So in other words, what I'm saying, I would have liked to have seen him redirect his run or even stop, just hold his hands up because the guy's through. You're not going to stop him from there. 
The only thing um, is, though, I don't think he can stop because... If actually, the, yeah, you're right there. He can't stop. The guy shoots and Leno saves it. But but I get you, he could have maybe redirected the run. Redirect the run so that you're still tracking the ball. So if the ball does come back off the post or if it hits Leno, you're in a position to clear it. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. I want to... Um, <laughs> <laughs> word stop. I want to... All the comments will blow up in one second. <laughs> exactly. So I don't everyone hitting me up saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, I retract that. The word stop. But my point is, if yeah. he redirects his run and doesn't touch the guy, then who knows what's going to happen next? Yeah. You said yourself earlier in the show that Saka missed a one-on-one, -on -one, a sitter. It happens. Who's to say that he's not going to shoot straight at Leno or put it wide, left or right, or over the bar? You know what I mean? So I'd just like to see defenders show a bit more street smartness there and say, actually, you know what? This guy's, if I go near him, he's going to go down. So let me just run around him a little bit, but still chase down the ball. Um, so I think that that was a little bit self-inflicted. Um, and, you know, not so much the goal, but the sending off changed the game. Because the way we were playing, even if Wolves go into that second half, you know, at 1-1, I would still practice us to have got a result because you could see that Wolves were scared of us, man. You know what I mean? They were playing scared. Even when they were 2 1 up, they looked scared to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then for Leno, oh. what he did was unforgivable almost. You know what I mean? So it was it was almost like we managed to claw defeat from the jaws of victory. It was very much self inflicted, is what disappointed me. Do you know the thing? Leno is quite lucky that the focus today is all on the ref and blue. <laughs> yeah. What Leno did is absolutely. I don't know what that guy is thinking. Like, it's a long ball. You've got all that time to see it. You know the pitch is wet because it's raining. Any goalkeeper will tell you, you get your body behind the ball. So if anything, it's going to hit you in the chest. You know, you can head it. If it's low enough, you can volley it. He's literally running at the side of the ball. And he's thought, oh, no, the, the ball's hit the ground, probably gained speed, and, and he's just slapped it. And it's like, what on earth are you doing? That He's been brilliant this season. But that moment, you know, I've been critical of Mikel Arteta. Everyone knows it. At them moments there, I just look and think, as a manager, you must be thinking, what, what am I supposed to do yeah. when an experienced international player is doing something like that? And, um, I mean, what I will say, the only thing I will say at Arteta, I'm being kind with Arteta today, people. Here it only, comes. Here it comes. <laughs> the thing I will say I felt the substitutions weren't great. I felt at half time we knew Gabriel or Chambers were going to come on, um, preferably Gabriel. But I would have taken Smith Rowe off because Wolves had a two man midfield of Jao Martino and Ruben Neves. We had Jacker and Thomas Partey. I feel them two could have handled them two. Mm -hmm. But having played in teams where you go down to 10 men, I think you need a striker. You need an outlet. Lacazette has got good hold up play. You get the ball up to him. That gives you time to support him. I think we could have sacrificed Smith Rowe being the number 10. He took Lacazette off. We had no one playing up against their centre-backs. And you've got Smith Rowe just running around, can't get the ball. And, and you know, we didn't, we didn't really have an opportunity to attack Wolves in that second half. I felt like, leave Lacazette up there, be patient, stay in the game at 2-1, even though they've scored. And maybe last 10, 15, 20 minutes, have a go. I would rather lose 3-1 trying to equalize then just sit there and say ah oh, we've lost 2-1 that, that's just that's just me i don't know you said something similar i just didn't feel like we had a go and i know when it goes to nine men it becomes more difficult but i felt like you know pepe again what a goal one of the goals of the season we should be talking about pepe today unfortunately the rest of the stuff's overshadowed it and then you take him off and i'm thinking when you've got 10 men that little piece of individual brilliance is what you're relying on to get a goal. So I wouldn't have taken Lacazette off and I wouldn't have taken Pepe off. They're, they're the two subs that I didn't like, to be honest. I agree entirely. Uh, and we've spoken about this before. But yeah, listen, man. Um, taking off Lacazette, I thought, was the incorrect decision. Um, but taking off Pepe, I thought that was even worse, to be honest. Because let's be honest, man. And I know I... I've been capping for Pepe recently, so, you know. Okay. Yeah. But you know what? And, and, you know, I said this to you behind the scenes and before the show, and I'm going to say it publicly. And again, I know some people are going to rip me and all that, but say what you want about Pepe. But that goal that he scored, 
um, in that same game. I'm not being funny, bro, but I don't see on current form anyway. And make possibly Saka. Nobody else scoring a goal like that. No. He does have incredible skills like that. And when he's on, which he is on at the moment, when he's on form, you know what I mean? You, you, have to, you have to keep him on the pitch because he can produce a moment of brilliance of that that would turn the game back in our favour. Mm. I mean, and like you said, even with 10, 9 men, I still think that we were a threat because like you said, we were bossing that midfield, man. You yeah. know? Uh, and we needed to have had an outlet, which is why I would have taken off Lacazette. I would have looked elsewhere. Like you said, I think Emil Smith-Rowe, who, to be fair to him, he's been brilliant. A yeah. lot of other games, he's not been at his best form. So, to me, that's where the substitution should have been made. Um, so, yeah, I wasn't in favour of Pepe going off. Um, and, yeah, you know, it was a case of we threw that away, really, because we had chances in the first half that we didn't take. Um, David Luiz and Bert Leno have done, well, especially Bert Leno. I don't know what he was playing at there. Ugh. So a lot of this was self-inflicted. Yeah. Which kind of brings me round to the main topic of discussion for this week's show. So let's be honest, man. We, we've um, pretty much thrown away a game that we were well on the way to winning. Yeah. Is this an ode to the fragile confidence and the lack of game management that we spoke about a couple of weeks ago on this show? I don't want to be too negative because we have been on a good run recently. Yeah. Um, we had a show a couple of weeks ago where we discussed this and we got some interesting comments in from the viewers who watch the show. Shout out to all the people who, who commented. And, and they kind of agreed with us, which is that although we were on a good run of form, the confidence at Arsenal is a little bit fragile, you know what I mean? And um, two games in the last week, no wins, uh, a pretty ordinary performance against Man United, I thought a much better performance against Wolves, but then we've gone on to lose it. So we haven't won in two. Uh, we've got some very difficult games coming up. So my question to you, Curtis, the overall question I guess I want to put to you is, um, is this a blip or is this Arsenal being consistently inconsistent? Curtis? I mean, what I will say, I think... I do think it's different from November and, and those times when we, you know, we were losing to Burnley and teams like that. I think at them times we looked like we had no idea to win those games. What I will say for Mikel Arteta, I do think that over the last few games, you can see how it's starting to take shape. That first 45 against Wolves, we look really good. For the Southampton game, we played really well. You know, we have seen improvements. Um, but it, it's just Arsenal beating Arsenal, really. You know, we, you know, I spoke to, to a Wolves guy who come on uh, and did a preview, and he said, you know, it, we didn't beat Arsenal. We we beat ourselves. You know what I mean? We kind of we cause difficulties that don't need to happen. Um, listen, obviously, with that game, we can look at VAR and the referee. I get that, uh, and and everyone will look at that. But it's just so typical of Arsenal over over the months, over the years. I mean, I think this this has got to be the most red cards that we've had in a season. I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, it's the most red cards we've ever had. It's you know, nine. I think it's nine at the moment. Nine red cards is nine red cards. You've got to look and say, is there is there a discipline issue at the football club? Mm. Um, you know, I know. The, uh, the David Luiz one, we can argue, but for, looking back at them, Leno's ones are red. You know, Pepe headbutted the guy, although didn't make a lot of contact, but mm. you know the ref will send you off for that. You know, Xhaka grabs the guy around the throat. You know, it's just, we're our own worst enemy in that sense, you know, and, and I think that run earlier in the season was so damaging that mm. despite this quality little run of form that we've had, that still hasn't, you know, it hasn't, they always say we need to we need surgery. We don't need a plaster. You know, it's, there's still an open wound under that plaster, man. And one or two defeats, and all of a sudden, it's an open wound again. You know, you're looking at it now. Tough games coming up. Leno suspended. I know the club are going to appeal David Luiz, and I think they might actually win that appeal. You know, we got to pray that Matt Ryan um, <laughs> is fit within the next few days, bro. You know, I give credit to Renarsson. He played well for that. 20 odd minutes, but I don't think any Arsenal fan trusts for an Arsenal to play the next game or two in goal. So we need to hope that Matt Ryan is, is yeah. back very quickly, man. 
Well, it's an interesting point you make about the, the nine red cards. Now, that would appear to indicate that we're like a bruising kind of physical side. But I don't think we are over physical. OK, recently we've acquired Thomas Party, and that strengthened us in midfield. So teams are not going to bully us like that anymore. You've got Xhaka and Partey, both of them very solid physical presence in the middle of the park there. You know what I mean? And we do have other guys that can tackle and can run and can chase. Um, so we're not over physical. Uh, I think the red cards have come from, like you said earlier, lack of discipline and um, some players not really game managing the game as well as they should do. Yeah. Far too many times this season I've seen the likes of Shaka and one or two others. Shaka sort of comes to mind because he seems to do it a lot. They get booked for silly fouls very early in a game. Yeah. And you're thinking to yourself, now you've got to be on tenter hooks for 60, 70, 75 minutes. You know what I mean? And when you're playing in midfield and areas like areas of the pitch like that, you commit one other bad foul, you're off. You know what I mean? And yeah. we've seen that a few times this season. So I just think that game management does appear to be a problem at Arsenal. You know what I mean? It, um, is that something that the manager should be a bit more on top of? Is that a coaching issue? I mean, the game at the highest level. What would you say on that, bro? It's the, with some players, it's just ingrained in them. Players like Xhaka, they've got moments of madness in them. I think that it's it's that could, more, be, that could be said for David Luiz as well. David Luiz as well. Seen, I mean, we've seen, not be funny, but we've seen Gabriel, who I'm a big fan of. We've seen he he can be impulsive and rash at times as well. I think there was a game earlier in the season where he got away with a couple at Fulham. I thought he could have gone there, man. You know what I mean? And uh, yeah. I you after that game, we were saying that someone needs to take him to one side and talk to him and say, yo, you know what? You need to, to be a bit more thoughtful. Um, yes, you know what I mean? It's a quick game and you, you've got to be reactionary and stuff like that. But you also, you've got to use this, man. You can't just rush in and commit fouls and get booked and then run yeah. and being sent off because at this level, with the competitiveness of this league, you go down to 10 men, teams very rarely, very rarely come back from that. You know what I mean? So a game could be decided on that alone. On that. And Gabriel was sent off on he against um, Southampton at yeah, home. Yeah. So yeah. it seems, uh, you know, he's, he's very aggressive. He wants to win the ball, Gabriel. It's funny that Gabriel won player of the month three months in a row, and now we can't get back in the team. And, We've actually had our best defensive record with him out the team. So although individually he might be our best centre-back, to be honest, but collectively, does he work? Because when him and Holding play next to each other, I don't think they're a very good partnership. You know, I think I don't mm -hmm. think they complement each other too well. So moving forward, you know, we need to we need to find the right partnership there. But it's just been such a frustrating season. Um you know, because I look at that Premier League table and I think, for me, we should be seven, eight, nine points better off than where we are. Looking back at some of them games, Burnley at home, Leicester at home, Wolves, we should have won, um, obviously, away, you know, and, and we could be close to that top four, which is why I'm so frustrated that we're 10th in the league. So, look, what I will say, Arteta's making improvements, but for this season in the Premier League, it might be too little too late. I think I think that Europa League now is is our only real hope of success this season. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's uh let's have a look at some receipts then. So right. as things currently stand, yeah, we're tenth in the table. We've acquired 31 points to date. So we played 22 games, we've won nine, we've lost nine and drawn four. Uh we're currently eight points off the top four places. But as he said, man, um unless we get it together real quickly, that top four is looking like a rather forlorn, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, we were on a seven-game unbeaten run. Now that's now come to an end. So realistically, do you think we can aspire to getting that top four? Or I mean, look, Laurie, the players have got, a, until it's mathematically impossible, they've got to go for it. I think realistically it's not going to happen. Because mm. although, although we're eight points off the top four, you know, I think when you look at the league, nearly all of those teams have got games in hand. Yeah. I think some of them have even got two or three games in hand. So once they play all their games in hand, that's more likely to be 11, 12, 13 points. With the runner games that we've got coming up and with our kind of inconsistencies, 
I think that'll be very difficult. I think the best we can we could probably hope for is maybe the top six, but I think we've got to try somehow. I don't know how, I don't know if we're capable of it, but we have to try and win that Europa League. Deal yeah. with Benfica and then hope we get the look of the draw that a few big teams knock each other out and, and hope somehow that we can win that competition. Uh, that That's our only hope for me this season. Yeah. You see, this is why, I mean, I said it at the time and I'll say it again. That is why I was so disappointed at the rather tame exit we made at the FA Cup. Because if we if we do win that competition, if we go on and win it, which, let's face it, we're more than capable of. We've done it last year. We're the record holders, winners of that competition. Then that would have got us into the Europa League. Um, and like you said, now that we're out of the Cups, the domestic Cups anyway, the Europa League realistically is our one chance back into uh, the Champions League, which has kind of been like the holy grail for Arsenal for the last couple of years, let's be honest. Yeah. Um, but you know what? I'm not going to give up hope just yet because as we've seen uh, in this um, current pandemic that's going on is that in terms of football, the results, they're so capricious, man. It's so up and down. You know what I mean, you can't really trust. Arsenal are the only ones that have been inconsistent, to be honest. Yeah, the whole, the whole league, the, every one of those twenty teams in the Premier League, you, you see some of the results and you think, "How did that happen?" You know what I mean? Um, but if we can just get our consistency right, is what I'm trying to say. I think we've got a much better chance because, to be fair to Arteta, the team has been performing a lot better recently. Yeah, yeah. And, um, certainly, the defense has improved beyond recognition uh, since he took over. We're still not totally fluid going forward but you know there are green shoots we are improving but I think one of the things we've got to try and get right is our is our uh how can I put it the game management the the discipline the consistency that kind of mental toughness required to win games like the one yesterday you know that's still not quite there for me no. um, how do you see us overcoming that bro I think number one we've still got to realize that Mikel Arteta has never been a manager, you know, so he's actually learning himself. He, you know, when these things happen, he's probably figuring it out himself, which was always my worry with an, a manager with no experience coming in. So I think it's a time thing. You know, I don't think it's any coincidence that as the season is going on, that Mikel Arteta is slowly improving because he's, at, you know, week by week, game by game, he probably becomes a slightly better manager. Um, it's just, you know, where where are we going to finish this season? I think finishing eighth, winning the FA Cup, our main thing was so much that we have to improve next season. We have to improve. And at the moment, you know, you can't really say we have improved that much in terms of league position and results. The results don't lie. We can say, this, that, the other, the defence is better and that, you know, that is positive. We can build on that. But I always say when you're at an elite football club, you still have to improve while you're there. You don't get a free hit. Mikel Arteta can't just throw this season away and say, well, you know, I'm going to be better next year. You've got to achieve something this year. So, look, man, I, I, I think over time he's becoming a better manager. It's just, you know, I, I think... We desperately need to get back in that Champions League. And, you know, it's such an open season, as you say, mm -hmm. which is why it's such a shame that we've been so inconsistent because really we should be in the mix for top four. But listen, there, there is still a long way to go. So, you know, we still got to keep hope, I suppose. You're right. I mean, like you said, uh, the manager is inexperienced at this level. Um, and we've got, for the most part, a fairly young team. Um so, yeah, you know, you've got to factor all those things into the equation, which is why you should be, be able to rely on your more experienced players. Yeah. Um, so taking the game against Wolves as an example, we basically lost that game resulting from errors or happenstances from your more experienced players. Yeah. That's the reason. Now, even if you're not going to blame him, I'm not saying I blame him. Per se, I'm just saying I would have liked to have seen him be a bit cuter in that situation. And I'm sure he'll learn from, well, we hope he'll learn from that going forward. We've well, been saying that for years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so had that been one of the younger players that done that, then we yeah. could have said, look, you know what I mean? Hey, it's, it's Gabriel, he's a young guy. He's, he's fresh into the league. But it's David Luiz, man. He's one of our, if not most experienced player. 
Um, mm. and that happens to him. And then the Leno one, like I said, it's inexplicable how he does that. Yeah. Um, so, and this is why I talk about game management is so important. And you're going to really get that courtesy of the older, more experienced players who should be impressing that need upon the younger players. And instead, it's the older players that are at fault. So I'd like to see that improve, man. Um, yeah. And we've got some very difficult games coming up. So oh, it's a difficult one, man. It's a difficult I have, one. I have to say, um, it must be a nightmare for a defender in this modern game with VAR because some of the penalties, some of the decisions that you see go against defenders, you know, it's just, it must be a nightmare. They, they literally, in the penalty area, unless they can clearly win the ball, they can't they can't touch the attacker in yeah. any way, shape or form. And it must be a nightmare. I honestly think that um, that VAR it has, has made, um, I think it's really hurt the game of football in this country. You know, even when we could go to the games, you know, it got to the point when a goal went in and I didn't actually celebrate a goal properly because I was like, oh, I'm glad we've scored, but let me look at the screen and see if it counts. You know, I think I think they have to assess VAR big time in this country because I do think it's put a massive downer on football in this country. We we seem to use it worse than anyone around Europe and the standard of referees, richest football um, league in the world and the referees are embarrassing at times. Now, I think they need to wipe the slate clean. I think 80, 90% of them refs, they need to get rid of, bring in a new generation of referees, man, because these guys are totally out of it, man. I must admit, my view is slightly different. I'm actually in favour of VAR. And yes, like all technology, it's how you use it. Um, I don't think that the interpretations have been the best. I still think some of the, the, the laws of the game need looking at. For example, we had that ridiculous decision the other day, you know, the Villa game versus Man City. We've now had this game, the yeah. Arsenal's game, and the um, the Villa Man City game necessitated a rule change. I suspect that what happened against Wolves with the David Luiz sending off, where they're talking about double jeopardy and all that stuff, that may also necessitate a rule change. Unfortunately for us, it would have come too late to do anything yeah. about the game versus Wolves. So, yeah, that's my quick thoughts on VAR. Yes, there are quite a few things wrong with it, including the interpretations and the fact that. A lot of the referees don't use the monitor anywhere near as much as they should do. So, yeah. like I said, to me, it's not so much the technology, it's how you use it and how you interpret it. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, you know, I'm in favour of VAR. However, the games, let's just use the phrase, things even up over the course of the season, which is what we've been told. So, I guess we have to go with that. But I just think that if Arsenal are to take that step and you know, really try and push for a top four place or win the Europa League. There are certain things in our game that we do need to tighten up on. And discipline and game management, I think, are two of those things. Yeah. Uh, we've discussed that. So interesting to hear what the people watching the show think of that. Let us know what you think, man. Um, but hey, okay, moving on again then to our Ops of the Week. Uh, as we always say on this show, the one thing about football is, is that after a loss, you quickly get the chance to redeem yourself. So this weekend, we're away to Villa. Now, at the time of recording the show, Villa are where? What? They're ninth in the table, one place ahead of Arsenal, one point ahead on 31 points. Again, I stress that this is at the time of recording. We know that Villa have a game coming up against West Ham, so that could well change. Um, but there are three games in hand over us at the moment. Obviously, they're playing the West Ham game, as I've just said. Yeah, 19 games, won 10, lost 7, drawn 2. However, it has to be said that back in November, they played us at the Emirates and they humbled us, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was 3-0. In fact, got to say that on that day, we were saying after the match that it could have been more than three. Um, yeah. So superior were they to us on that day. I mean, Jack Grealish yeah. was just running around, running the show. He completely yeah. ran that game, man. But obviously, we're a different team now, so I'm expecting a different type of performance and hopefully result but Curtis what's your thoughts bro my thoughts are please Matt Ryan be available for this game fella I'm telling you <laughs> Matt Ryan FC mate we can't go there with Renarsson in goal um well, I, Renarsson, he did pull off a couple of good saves yeah, well yeah and, but um, I must just say as well that um he was he almost provided an assist there because 
<laughs> he the lovely, you know, when we had that last gas free kick. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in the dying embers of that game, he floated a lovely ball in, man. That if somebody had made the right connection, who knows, we might even have got out of there with a equalizer. Yeah, no, nah, but listen, man, we're an arson. He did well for them twenty, but that that's enough for me. You know, that's enough. But um, Villa, as you said, this is the only game probably this season where I've I've come away from the game and just said, "You've ju we got to take that defeat. We just got beat." You know, I, I think it's easier in any sport. You know, you've you've um, boxed as well. I've played football. If someone's just better than you and they outperform you, sometimes you just got to hold your hands up and say, we just couldn't cope with that on that night. You know, it's them defeats like the Wolves game and stuff where the frustration and the Burnley game, you know, where you throw them away. Um, as you said, I think we're a better team than we were when we played Villa back in November. I, I think Villa have been a little more inconsistent as well since since then, although they're still doing well, you know, if they win those games in hand. Uh, again, and I, and I say it every week, um, we need to win this game. We need to win this game. Otherwise, the top four is genuinely gone. It, uh, it is already anyway. We need to go there and beat them. Mm. Don't be afraid of them. We've got to figure out a way to deal with Grealish better because... He just had free roam against us last time. It was like an audition to try and get himself a move. So, um, you know, I, I always say with Arsenal, how often do you see, you know, when, when when a team's got a danger man on their team, how often do you see an Arsenal player just clamp him down? Just say, listen, I'm going to take a yellow card, but I'm going to let him know he's in a hard game. When someone's having a good game against Arsenal, it's like they just keep going, just just keep going, keep ripping us apart, you know. Sometimes you've actually got to leave one on them and let him know it's a tough day at the office. Um, I know it sounds a bit old school, but, mm. you know, um, but yeah. Well, we, we've got to come up with a game plan to counteract Jack Grealish, that's for sure. We can't allow him to run rampant like we did back in November, otherwise he'll destroy yeah. us. I must say, though, um, I've really enjoyed watching Jack Grealish. Brilliant. Um, perform to that level against us this weekend but um yeah man he's been outstanding but then we've got guys in the team that are outstanding ourselves man Saka you know what I mean he's been brilliant you know what I mean we got um and some guys coming into some good form right now Partey, Lacazette, Pepe, Pepe free Pepe you know what I mean so <laughs> yeah we we I'm I'm confident we can go there and give them a game we've been performing away from home better than we have at home over the course of the season uh, yeah. And like I said previously, that the Premier League in this pandemic era is proving one of those where you cannot with real surety predict any of the results. It's literally been like that, man. So yeah. I'm hoping that we can go there, um, throw off the Wolves' defeat, put that down to what it was down to, which, as I said, a bit of a lack of discipline and game management. Learn from that. Go into this game. Go to Villa with a game plan, not be reckless, and uh, express ourselves at the same time. I think we can get a win there, man, or at least a point. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, you look at it, I know we're going to have suspensions, but, you know, hopefully Matt Ryan is available. David Luiz being suspended without being disrespectful is not the end of the world in, in that, you know, we've got players like Gabriel and that who are competent defenders. Um We've got basically all of our attacking players available now. Bamiang's back, Martinelli, you know, Saka, Pepe. I think we can still go there and hurt this Villa defence. You know, I have to say, I thought, uh, I call him the general, Thomas Party. I thought he was brilliant at times in that Wolves game. That ball that he played in the first minute to Saka, just an incredible pass. And uh, he seems to be fully fit now, finding his form. So listen, we're down about the Villa game. We're all annoyed, but... I think we can go and beat Aston Villa, and uh, I think I think the the team will find it in them to beat them. I think we've got enough in the attack. Yeah, I agree. I think. Listen, um, back in November, like I said earlier, we got humbled by Villa. They were they were the much better side. Like I said, the three 0 defeat almost flattered us. We were that bad. But since then, I think it's been evident that we are a better team, and we have players now in the team that are showing some good form. Uh, Saka, Smith Rowe, Partey. Xhaka even, you know what I mean? Um, he's improved. Um, Rob Holding, uh, let's give a shout out to Rob Holding. He's been, he's improved his game. He's looking a lot more solid now. Um, so yeah, I'm confident that if we go there and put in a good performance, we can win. So 
bro, at this time in the show, I always ask you for your prediction, man. So give us your prediction, scoreline. You know what? I, I keep going with the same safe scoreline every week. It's kind of that scoreline when you're not certain we're going to win, but you hope we're going to win. So I'm saying 2-1 again, because you can see Villa troubling us with that attack. You know, yeah. Grealish and Watkins and Barkley and that. Um, but I do think we'll score goals, so I'll go for 2-1. I mean, initially, when I first thought about this game, I was going to go for the proverbial Desmond, which is 2-2. Oh, yeah. And then I kind of thought to myself that after the injustices of the Wolves game, that might spur us on to pull it out of the bag this week. So I'm going to go for a 2-1. Uh, yeah. And I'm not just capping when I say that. I think we can go there and get a win. So yeah. as long as we take care of... The essentials, you know, I mean, we go in there and execute the game plan properly. I think we, we have got the quality there and the guys in form to get a win. So I'm going like you, 2 1 win, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Okay, bro. So, like, we're coming to the end of the show now, man. Uh, another show that I've really enjoyed participating in. So thanks, Curtis. Thanks for your honest and forthright opinions as usual. Um, tell the people where they can find you, bro. Yeah, man, check out the channel, Curtis Shaw TV, daily uploads, watch alongs, all of that, man. We, you know, it's a roller coaster of emotion with Arsenal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, listen, man, I know your channel's getting enough traction at the moment, man. And um, yeah, man, it's good stuff, entertaining as always. So yeah, yeah. man, keep, keep that going, bro. Just going to ask you before we go, it's Super Bowl weekend. I'm not sure, are you an American football fan or what? You watch it? I only really watch the Super Bowl. I don't watch it the rest of the year. Yeah, okay. So this weekend, Super Bowl, um, I think what's Kansas City Chiefs versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Mm. And this game is being billed as the young lion, Patrick Mahomes versus Tom Brady, the two quarterbacks. So have you got any thoughts on who's going to win? I reckon Tampa will win. I'm going, I'm going Tampa. You're going Tom Brady. Yeah. I'm Brady. We'll pull it out of the bag, but it'll be interesting um, if Kansas. Yeah. They yeah, look I'm going for they won it last time and they've unearthed a new star, Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, man. Yeah, I'm going. I'm going. I, I will be watching the Super Bowl. I'm not sure if I'll stay up for all of it, but I yeah. will certainly watch the start of it because obviously coming kind of the early hours of the morning. But yeah, I'm going Kansas City Chiefs for what it's worth. Yeah. But yeah, back to back to the business. Listen, bro, thanks very much, and thanks to all the people out there for watching the show. Please comment on the show. Message us, whatever you want to do, as long as you be interactive. We like that. Um, thanks for tapping in, people. Really enjoyed having you along with us. And um, we'll see you all next week. Keep safe. Keep COVID free. Keep wearing those masks. Observe the social distancing laws. Observe the rules in general. Let's get through this together. Thank you very much for watching the Talk is Cheap show. See you next week, guys. It's Robbie here from AFTV. Don't forget to check out AFTV on Flick for all the latest transfer rumours, for all the information on Arsenal, for all the information on AFTV. You can check me there for Q&As on a regular basis. The link is in the description. It is free to download. Download it right now.